What's going on, everybody? RJ Ochoa here from SB Nation's bloggingtheboys.com. Hope all is well wherever you are. We hope you're happy, safe, healthy, and somehow that you're excited for this week's Dallas Cowboys game. I know that last week didn't go exactly how we wanted it to. I know we're all upset that the Dallas Cowboys lost, but this week is a new opportunity, a new chance. That's the beauty of the NFL. You deal with things for one week. You get back on the saddle. You try to go back again. The Dallas Cowboys 6-2 and two, looking to get their seventh win on the season. The uh, hectic part of their schedule is coming up. Next Sunday, the Cowboys will be on the road taking on the Kansas City Chiefs before a very quick turnaround on Thanksgiving Day. Home contest is always against the Las Vegas Raiders. But before that, the Dallas Cowboys this particular Sunday at noon, rare occasion the Cowboys play back-to-back noon games at AT&T Stadium, will be hosting the Atlanta Falcons. And look, I'll be honest with you. Today, the day I'm shooting this, Friday, November 12th, 2021, is the four-year anniversary of the Chaz Green game. You know the one I'm talking about. Bad vibes right there. But good vibes, I think, coming into this game. We all know the Dallas Cowboys were humbled this past week. We know the Cowboys, obviously, are looking uh, to kind of really make a lot of us calm down because we're all worried that we're starting to see some wear and tear on this season. We're all worried that we're starting to see something bigger, uh, some symptoms of something bigger. But you know, the hope is that last week was just kind of a blip on the radar, something that happens to weird teams. Look at the Baltimore Ravens on Thursday Night Football. Sometimes really good teams lose weird games. That's just life in the NFL. And the Atlanta Falcons are not necessarily a uh, really bad team like the Miami Dolphins are. In fact, I think the Denver Broncos are actually better than the Atlanta Falcons. But look, all that considered, this is still a game the Cowboys are going to have to take seriously. It is our preview show. In case you are somehow unaware, we are going to speak to somebody who covers the Atlanta Falcons. We're going to dive into the film room, obviously, to get a little bit of a deeper idea in terms of what to understand about this Falcons team, some players to pay attention to. But before we do that, a few bullet points from me. Now, number one, uh, Cowboys offense, wake up. Got to wake up here. Got to wake up. It feels like, you know, when you're a kid and you're trying to get up for school and you're like fighting the alarm clock, you got to wake up. You have to wake up. You cannot go scoreless to the first three quarters of the game like they did against the Denver Broncos. You can't do that against anybody and expect to win. You have to wake up and be a part of this game. This is still an elite offense. I know you want to make your jokes. I know you're going to say in response to that, yeah, right, elite offense. Elite offenses don't go scoreless through the first three quarters of a game. Again, I'd put it to you. Look at the Baltimore Ravens on Thursday night. Look at the Buffalo Bills against the Jacksonville Jaguars. Look Look at the Los Angeles Rams against the Tennessee Titans. Sometimes elite offenses are contained. Sometimes it's because they're playing elite defenses, which the Atlanta Falcons are not. Sometimes it's just because football is weird. Sometimes it's because a team wears a red stripe on their helmet, like the Dallas Cowboys. I love the red stripe. I hate that people think it's cursed. More than anything, I think the Cowboys missed an incredible marketing opportunity to wear the red stripe this week after Taylor Swift re-released her album, Red. I mean, talk about the symmetry there, but, you know, that's a conversation for a different sort of preview show. Next bullet point from me. Atlanta is not an amazing offense. I know that they have Matt Ryan. I know that they have Kyle Pitts right now. I know that we have this kind of idea in the back of our minds that Atlanta can obviously put some points on the board. I know they won last week against the New Orleans saying something we'll talk about with our special guest, Gina Kelly, but they are not that great of an offense. And this is hindsight. I recognize this. I know you're going to say, RJ, you're only saying this because the Cowboys lost last week, but the Denver Broncos offense there was some substance to it. Every week, every single week at bloggingtheboys.com, we look at the remaining schedule for the Dallas Cowboys through the lens of offensive EPA per play and defensive EPA per play allowed. EPA is expected points added, which in, you know, uh, you know, in some layman's terms, looks at the efficiency of each team's offense and defense on a play-by-play basis. Now, the Denver Broncos, again, I know this is hindsight, but entering last week, the Denver Broncos offense actually looked kind of promising from an EPA perspective. We talked about this last week in our preview show. And so while I don't think any of us expected the, not that they went out and threw for a million yards or ran for a million yards, although it felt that way or put up a million points, but the Broncos offense was hard for the Cowboys defense to contain last week. And my point is there was some evidence to support that claim. There is not that evidence to support that claim when it comes to the Atlanta Falcons. This is a weaker offense. I know that it doesn't feel that way. I know you want to panic because of the way the Cowboys lost last week, but this is a weaker offense and one that the Cowboys defense should have every opportunity to get back on track against. My final bullet point before we move on here, don't focus on last week. 
Don't focus on last week. Focus on this week. Focus on this game. And here's something, you know, it's been said many times by many people in many different sports that sometimes when teams or players are down in certain moments, they're trying to get it all back in one moment. And I think we saw that last week with the Cowboys. I think that Dak Prescott was trying to get it all back, trying to go score, you know, 20, 30 points in one drive. And you can't. It's about incremental growth. It's about incremental scoring. And in some ways, that's what you look at the you know entire season like, right? It's about incremental growth. You can't go right now this week against the Atlanta Falcons and go make yourselves eight and one. You can't. It doesn't work that way. If you win, you could be seven and two. That's it. You can only get one win out of this. No matter how badly you beat the Atlanta Falcons, if you win Dallas Cowboys, it counts the exact same as the win against the Minnesota Vikings with Cooper Rush. It's the exact same as the win against the Los Angeles Chargers off the Greg Zerline field goal. It counts the exact same. It's one win. You cannot make it more than that. And I think all the reports coming out of the star have really reflected Mike McCarthy understanding this idea, understanding this mindset that you can't dwell on last week. You can't make this about going and getting more. This is about one game, one week, one team, the Atlanta Falcons, go beat them, move on. Next week, you have the same conversations. You take the exact same approach. That's how the Cowboys have to look at this week's game against the Atlanta Falcons. Now, uh, we didn't you know, discuss this, but obviously not an ideal situation that Randy Gregory is not going to be playing for the Cowboys, placed on injured reserve with a calf strain. Calves are a really big problem for the Dallas Cowboys this season, and so we hope Randy's getting right, but uh, it's fair to say that we're all really counting on and expecting and, and hoping that Micah Parsons shows up again uh, in a prominent way as a pass rusher, something we did see in the aforementioned win against the Los Angeles Chargers. It is time, though, to speak with somebody who knows the Atlanta Falcons better than any of us. One of my great friends, one of my great colleagues at SB Nation, Gina Kelly, covers the Atlanta Falcons uh, for the Falcoholic SB Nation's Atlanta Falcons community. You can hear her, by the way, this week on Girls Talking Boys, one of our shows on the Blog and the Boys podcast network. She was on with Kelsey Charles and Meg Murray, if you want to hear a longer discussion. But Gina joined me for some time. We are obviously going to talk about the Atlanta Falcons, but I do want to let you know that when we recorded, my dog was not exactly being a good boy. So you're going to hear some dog barking and uh, bear, you know, sometimes he just wants to be a part of the show. But here is Gina Kelly talking all things Atlanta Falcons. Pleased to be joined by the one, the only, the legendary, the incomparable, internationally famous, known across multiple galaxies. Uh, she loves the New Orleans Saints and the Michigan Wolverines. From I SB Nation, it is Gina Kelly, Gina Thomas, known by a thousand different names. I know her as Queen Gina. Gina, thank you so much for taking the time to join our preview show at Blocking the Boys, your favorite SB Nation community. Yes, and my second favorite because the Falcoholic is my favorite. But mm. um, yeah, anyway, hi, RJ. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be with you. Um, my dog, I was literally about to say, loves to bark the most when you are on the receiving end of conversation, Zoom calls, whatever. Uh, your dogs are very happy because you just moved. Yes, they have so much more space. Um, I don't know where. Oh, yeah, they're just snoozing, just laying around. Um, but yeah, I think that your dog's just saying hi to my dogs. I think that that's the main thing. Just they're buddies now. You've always been rather generous when it comes to Bear and uh, and his proclivity to bark. Uh, you mentioned your favorite community. Dude, chill. It's the preview show. We're not going to edit this out. Uh, is, uh, is the Falcoholic. You love the Atlanta Falcons and Ohio State, the Ohio State. Actually, I've never told you this. I really hate when other schools do that. Like, I hate when other players on Sunday Night Football try to be like the University of Dayton. It's like, dude, no, there's, there's no. only one team that can do this. But anyway, uh, your thoughts on the 2021 Atlanta Falcons so far? Oh, uh, they have certainly been an adventure so far this year. We didn't really know what to expect going into the season with a brand new coaching staff. Um, obviously had a lot of pretty major personnel changes, including Julio Jones being traded to the Tennessee Titans. So it was, you know, we were not real sure what we were getting into um, with this team. Obviously, we saw the learning curve in full effect early in the season. The team looked pretty shaky there early on, um, but we've seen them kind of hit their stride recently. Matt Ryan is playing very well. Um, the offensive line has a long way to go, but that's understandable because they've got a younger and experienced player at center, which is such an important position and um, also at guard. And so <clears throat> when you have that kind of instability along the interior line, it can cause some problems, but they've improved their pass blocking at least, even though the run game is still non-existent. Cordero Patterson has been an absolute delight. I, I did not expect him to be this good. I did not expect to be shopping for Cordero Patterson Falcons jerseys in week 
whatever this is of the NFL season 10, I think. Um, nine, 10, who knows? It's 10. Long season. 10, okay. <laughs> I was right the first time. Um, but yeah, Cordero's been great. And the defense is a work in progress. Um, the defense has been a work in progress for a number of years. They still don't really have any pass rush to speak of, but still, you know, I think that adapting to DNP's scheme, we're seeing incremental improvement week to week, which is really all that you can hope for. Um, on the subject of Cordero Patterson, I feel like if you are a notable return man in the NFL, you have to play for the Falcons at a certain point. Yes. Like you, you have to. It's just a rule at this point. Deion Sanders, Devin Hester, Cordell Patterson. Um, you just it's, it's a rite of passage at this point. Very interesting to see him, obviously, in the success that he's having. I don't know which mm-hmm. Falcons jersey you're going with. I don't like any of them. I know we've had this conversation. So uh, maybe yes. like get the old school throwback black ones. Those are the only ones that are. Uh, passable in my mind, at least. Those I was, are my favorites. Right. I, I was incorrect about the Falcons this season, Gina. At first, I thought that they might have this sort of honeymoon bump uh, that you sometimes see with veteran teams, specifically veteran quarterbacks, you get a new head coach, kind of a change of scenery. That has not happened. And I know you were on Girls Talking Boys on the Blog of the Boys podcast network with Kelsey Charles and Meg Murray. Uh, but, you know, the YouTube audience doesn't care about that. The YouTube audience is here and wants <laughs> to hear your words again. Um, I, the fact that that hasn't happened, I feel like, has made Cowboys fans feel better about Dan Quinn. You know, mm-hmm. like like Dan wasn't the problem, you know, because that, that would, I think, justify that, that Dan Quinn was kind of the, you know, the kryptonite plaguing an otherwise really efficient offense, really efficient team. What are your thoughts on kind of the transition, the new the new coaching, you know, system and everything like that? D- seeing Dan Quinn have success in Dallas, not a great week for that question, obviously, but your thoughts in general. Um, first of all, <clears throat> I've been thrilled to see Dan having such uh, success in Dallas, with the exception of the game against the Broncos last week. Uh, that one was pretty rocky. But Falcons games against the Broncos historically are painful for Falcons. Yes, mm-hmm. absolutely. But um, yeah, so I, I don't think that the offensive issues were ever Dan. Um, I think that that was largely Dirk Cutter, who was a very predictable play caller. Um, A bunch of Falcons fans, including myself, were really shocked when they brought Dirk back again for a second run at the offensive coordinator position because he that's the NFC South thing is you bring back people (laughs) who have had success for that specific team. Yeah, just recycle them. Um, But yeah, his play calling was so predictable. He kind of moved them away from the zone blocking scheme and more to. So anyway, now they're moving back to the zone blocking scheme. I think that Matt Ryan is more effective in that scheme. I mean, that's what they were playing in under Kyle Shanahan when he won MVP during the 2016 season. So um, but yeah, the defense, I really think it wasn't Dan. Um, I think that past the point, the team was performing so poorly that players just kind of started whatever the coaches were saying to them kind of faded into the background. You know what I mean? Like a coach told me a long time ago, an offensive line coach who was with the, uh, the Eagles Super Bowl teams way back when told me that, you know, sometimes it really has nothing to do with the coach. Like a new coach is going to come in and they're going to coach the same fundamentals. They're going to be telling these players the same things they've been hearing since they were children sometimes they just need to hear it in a different voice. And I think that that's the point the Falcons got to under Dan Quinn. Um, But yeah, the, if you look at the cap situation and the caliber of defensive talent, the Falcons have, it's going to take them a few years to rebuild this defense into something, you know, consistently competent. And uh, that's more, I think on Thomas Dimitrov, because that's a problem that started a long time ago and now the cap situation has kind of come to a head and he's not here to deal with it anymore so it's gonna be a bit but yeah yeah but thomas dimitrov traded for julio jones which brought him a lot of cachet i feel like no gm skated off of a move a single move longer than thomas dimitrov off of that but um you know it is what it is um the falcons beat the saints and so Mm -hmm. i feel like um sometimes this happens where i feel like I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but certainly uh, based off of, of t- your tweets and uh, the Falcoholics tweets, um, if, if if the Falcons didn't win another game the rest of the season, I feel like you would be content. And so I, I kind of feel like sometimes when that happens to a team, because this happened last week, it's kind of like, whatever, we, we, we want our, our Super Bowl, so to speak. I don't mean to lower the standards of the Atlanta Falcons, but, you know, like I kind of feel like. A lot of Cowboys fans are really worried about this game, like because of what happened last week against Denver. But I kind of feel like you're getting a a Falcons team that that's just had a big meal. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And it's coming in and not exactly ready for a fist fight, so to speak. 
And they also have the Patriots coming up next Thursday. Mm. And obviously, you know, there's a lot of history there. Um, a lot of, huh? Why? <laughs> Why? Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know if you remember Super Bowl 51, <laughs> but it did not go well for Atlanta. Um, it went very well at the beginning and then not so well afterward. And sure. my husband, the Patriots fan, and I will be at that Thursday night game. But, you know, that's the other thing. So they've got a quick turnaround to play a team that they're going to have to hear 28 to 3 stuff all week leading up to it. And so um, that's another factor. You know, I, it was really encouraging to see the Falcons beat the Saints because the Saints throughout Mike Smith and Dan Quinn's tenure seemed to mostly have the team's number. Dan Quinn fared better against them than Mike Smith did, but um, it was really encouraging to see the Falcons kind of setting things up to be the same old Falcons and blow it at the end of the game and then actually pull it off. Like I'm not used to being happy about sports and now the Braves and the Falcons have won you know, I mean, it was a good week, great on week a different you. level. Yeah, yeah. On kind of a different level, but like both very big games for Atlanta fans. So yeah. Um, yeah. Good week for you, Gina, certainly uh, with the Braves winning the world series and the, the Falcons obviously winning hectic week for you with moving and everything, a lot going on. That's a, <laughs> a fine line to tread too, because some to our thread tread uh, because like, I'm sure you were like canceling internet and TV services and starting new ones. That's a stressful thing when you've got games you want to watch. Uh, so congratulations to you for navigating that. So Thanks. what is the difference then? Because you said, like, I'm, I'm so used to seeing this Falcons team disappoint me. What's that that different factor then the Cowboys fans have to look out for this particular week? Is it uh, this is low hanging fruit? Is it Kyle Pitts? You know, like what, what is what is the difference in your mind that at least felt different last week against New Orleans? Um, I mean, one of the things isn't a difference. Matt Ryan has been really clutch with fourth quarter comebacks his entire career. Um, but that was something that kind of died off a little bit toward the end of Dan Quinn's tenure. And so seeing him be able to get back to that form with Arthur Smith's play calling. The other thing is, and I think that this is really key, Smith, we saw some really questionable in-game decisions early on, which is not surprising from an inexperienced rookie head coach. And so we've seen him improve. We've seen him learn from those decisions and grow as a head coach. And that's something that I think is really important right now. And so I think that those are really the two main factors, just that Matt Ryan remains clutch and Arthur Smith is a much better play caller than dirt cutter. <laughs> Um, my last real one is as we get ready to say goodbye here, um, because you have to, you know, throw away the cardboard boxes or whatever. Um, are you satisfied with the Kyle Pitts pick? Because uh we're in a you know, every week is is a crazy reshuffling in the NFL, but looking at uh I mentioned it earlier, kind of the Carolina Panthers in the NFC South as well. Lots of people while they're enjoying the Cam Newton return storyline, it's a matter of well, you got rid of Cam, you brought Teddy in, you traded for Donald, you picked up his fifth-year option, you traded Teddy away, you passed on Justin Fields, and so now it's it's this question of should they have drafted Justin Fields or even Mac Jones. Do you feel that way in any way? I mean, Kyle Pitts has, has started to kind of become the great player that a lot of people thought he would be. Is there any man I wish you would have taken Justin Fields? And Because you said, like, this is a, a multi-year sort of reboot, reprocessing for the Falcons. Or are you happy with Kyle Pitts? You feel like he's a great person, a uh, great asset for whoever the future quarterback of the Atlanta Falcons is going to be. I think that Pitts is just a phenomenal, like, next-level athlete. And we've already seen little flashes here and there of what he can do, like, seen him hauling, you know, one-handed catches on the sideline. Just he's a he's just a physical freak. He is an incredible athlete, creates such mismatches with his size and his speed. I love the Pitts pick. Uh, selfishly, I would have loved to draft Justin Fields, but that is because I'm an Ohio State fan. This team very rarely gives me Buckeyes to root for. Um, but I think that considering Matt Ryan's contract, they did have to shift that up a little bit this offseason so that they would have enough cap space to work with um, eventually after trading Julio so they could sign their draft class. Uh, just knowing that that dead money would hamstring the team for years to come and just already seeing the talent deficit that they have on defense because the cap has been kind of mismanaged over the past several years by Thomas Dimitrov. I think that sticking with Matt Ryan made more sense. They were able to restructure that deal, get more money up front that they can use to bring talent in around him. And um, when you look at, I mean, he just won um, NFC player of the week, offensive player of the week last week. You know, he's still playing at a very high level despite his age. So no, I'm thrilled with the Pitts pick. I think that he is going to be great for years to come. 
And I'm happy to still have Matt Ryan slinging it for Atlanta. Mm. Well, I'm happy that you're in a happy place, Gina. <laughs> Somebody who cares about you and wants to see you enjoy life and have success and happiness and joy and jubilation. I'm happy for you. I hope you're depressed as hell on Sunday uh, with regards to football. Uh, but, you know, hope the move goes well and everything in the process to get there. Yeah, thank you, RJ. And I personally hope that you are very sad on Sunday. But either way, I hope that you have a wonderful weekend. And thank you so much for having me. <laughs> My last question. Uh, it's We were talking before we started recording. Um, you mentioned you might watch Christmas Vacation with your husband. You said it's that time of year. What's your favorite thing to eat at home during the holiday season? Not necessarily Ooh. something you cook, you know, but but something that you just you love the and it may be more than the food, like the environment, maybe like the families over the big dishes, you know, the big ladles or whatever you're serving it with. Like what's what's a meal you really love around the holiday season that isn't Thanksgiving? You can't cheat. So this is going to be super Midwestern. Um, which makes sense because I'm from there originally. Uh yeah, it's not gonna sound like holiday food, but Football is such a big part of the holiday season. Buffalo chicken dip. Buffalo chicken dip. You put it in the crock pot. You've got it all day. People can snack on it. You can eat it with various things. You can actually make it into sandwiches. You have I've never had this. It's a great um, snack. Oh, what do you so like? Good. What are you dipping? Are you dipping like like what? Like I need to know like 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 tortilla chips. Like mm -hmm. what, what's what's the most common thing you're dipping it in? Tortilla chips, carrots, celery. You Car can do oh, God. pita bread. No. Okay. Yeah, the, the vegetables are optional. My husband won't eat those either. <laughs> pita bread. I like to <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. it sounds Gina, I'm be honest. It sounds like you're making like wannabe queso. That's that's <laughs> what it sounds like you're making uh in, to me. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, so other than this, this portion of it, this was a delightful conversation. <laughs> um, the, the watermelon, the why I didn't even mention the watermelon kick. I really wanted to, but, uh, I tried not to, um, <laughs> go Cowboys, go Ohio state, um, and, uh, go Gina Kelly. You're the best. Thank you so much for joining our preview show. <laughs> Thank you so much, RJ. <laughs> Want to give a big time shout out, big time thank you to Gina Kelly for taking the time to join us. Um, first thing, you saw me run out. Like I said, the dog was barking. Do what I can. Sometimes you get to see how the sausage is made here at Vlogging the Boys. Uh, Bear is, uh, you know, today's just not, you know, not, you know, he's a louder dog today. That's all it is. Second thing, for anyone who comes at me with the buffalo chicken dip thing, um, Gina and I spoke after uh, we finished recording, and my primary uh, point of disagreement here, I'm not, I'm not loving the idea of dipping celery in something hot. I love celery. Celery is great. I love the, what do they call it, negative calories. But if I'm going to dip celery in anything, it needs to be cool. I don't want to dip the celery in something hot, and then the celery starts to sweat. Anyway, you're not here for food takes. You're here for Cowboys Falcons discussion. Uh, sometimes we get off the rails here. Uh, let's um, let's figure out which Falcons to pay attention to. Matt Minnick, our film room expert, is now letting us into the cave to understand which Falcons the Cowboys had to be paying just a little bit more attention to come Sunday afternoon. The Cowboys are coming off a very disappointing loss last week, while their next opponent is coming off of a surprising win. No one expected much out of the Falcons this season. But last week's win over the New Orleans Saints elevated them to a 500 record on the season. Former Falcons head coach Dan Quinn is now the Cowboys deep at the coordinator. And ironically, it's his unit who will be challenged most by the Falcons. Quarterback Matt Ryan is on a mission to prove that he's still got what it takes to lead the Falcons to the playoffs. He has great touch, and at age 36, he's still got plenty of arm strength which he shows off on this 49-yard completion. Against the Saints last week, he went 23 of 30 for 343 yards, two touchdowns passing, and another touchdown rushing. Expect the Falcons to challenge the Cowboys' secondary vertically. Rookie Kyle Pitts may be a tight end, but he lines up all over the field, and he's a huge asset in the passing game, especially with Calvin Ridley currently away from the team. In this clip, Pitts lines up at receiver, and Ryan finds him on the over route. Pitts turns it into a huge gain, picking up 21 yards after the catch. Pitts is a tough matchup for any defense. His speed, size, and versatility will provide a major test for the Cowboys.
Despite rocket number 84, Cordero Patterson is actually a running back for the Falcons, but he still makes his presence known in the pass game. Here he splits out wide and catches a beautiful pass from Ryan on the sideline, setting up the game-winning field goal. Patterson is another talented, versatile player who the Cowboys defense will have to account for. The Falcons are riding high after last week's win, so it's important for the Cowboys to clamp down on these offensive playmakers early to prevent them from gaining confidence. Huge thank you to Matt Minnick for the wisdom, really, is what we're looking for here. Matt does a great job educating all of us. This game, I know you're a little bit nervous about it. I know you're worried. I know you want to see the Cowboys bounce back. Um, I think it happens, and uh, we'll get to my prediction in just a moment. In case you were curious, in case you somehow forgot, this game between the Cowboys and the Atlanta Falcons taking place on Sunday, November 14th at 1 p.m. Eastern, 12 p.m. Central Time, the true best time. I say as somebody who has only lived in a Central Time Zone throughout all of my life, you can watch this on Fox. And uh, you can hear Kevin Burkhart, Greg Olson, Pam Oliver back once again. Same crew that had the Cowboys Broncos game last week. A fine crew that Fox puts together this game at AT AT&T Stadium. If it wasn't obvious, the back to back home games for the Cowboys. Hopefully they're not both losses. You can always listen to the game if that is more your cup of tea on the home of the Dallas Cowboys. 105.3, the fan, Brad Sham, Babe Loffenberg, Christy Scales on the call right there. Sometimes some people, they prefer the home broadcast on the radio side with the visual broadcast. You you pause the TV, you line it up, you get the audio synced up with the video. That's the true way to fly, in my humble opinion. And speaking of my humble opinions, I've been saying it. I think the Cowboys are going to win this game, and I know you're anxious to know the score, my official score prediction for Sunday's Dallas cowboys Atlanta Falcons game. I've got the Cowboys winning 24-16. For what it's worth, I think that 16 is a little bit of a late cushion from the Falcons. Maybe it's 24 24- I don't know, 24-9, maybe we see something like that, like nothing but field goals from the Falcons. I really don't think the Falcons' offense is going to show up, and obviously that might uh, you know, blow up in my face on Sunday afternoon in our postgame show. But I think you know this could be something. There. It's 24-9, they come down, they score a touchdown, kick the extra point, whatever, and they try an onside kick, a great sort of you know reverse moment from the game last year. They don't get it, and then the Cowboys just take a couple of knees to end this thing. But uh, depending on when or where you look, the Cowboys about 8-10 to 10 point favorites been kind of fluctuating jumping around all week long prior to last week the Dallas Cowboys were the only undefeated team in the NFL against the spread they are now obviously seven and one against the spread this season uh I don't think they cover I would not take it depending on what you can get if you could somehow maybe get Cowboys seven Cowboys eight if you're feeling frisky but nine ten I don't want anything to do with that personally we just we want to see more we want to see the Cowboys bounce back this particular week uh it's gonna be fun like I said I mentioned the post game show as soon as the Dallas Cowboys game ends as we always are we'll be here on the blog on the boys YouTube channel and the blog on the boys Facebook page streaming our Dallas Cowboys post game show live come be a part of it be in the comments we'll have some fun we will celebrate together last week it was a lot of commiserating together but this week we will celebrate as the Dallas Cowboys get to seven and two and get ready to head to Kansas City to take on the Chiefs the do the two times let's say the defending the two time defending AFC champions going to be a lot of fun my name is RJ Cho. you know me of course from the blog on the boys universe blog on the boys.com here on the blog on the boys YouTube channel the blog on the boys podcast network subscribe here to our YouTube channel please subscribe to our podcast network leave a rating write a review those things really help you can follow me on Twitter or Instagram at RJ Ochoa. If you check out my Instagram, you'll see some pictures of the aforementioned dog bear. He's calmed down a little bit since we started putting this thing back together, getting this thing back on uh, on the rails. Uh, let's have a good one. I know you're scared. I know you're nervous, but it's going to be okay. And we'll see you after the game. Thanks for joining us, everybody. We love you all.